Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, The Science of Farm to Table. Sourdough bread is a microcosm of the global food crisis, presented by Rob Dunn, Professor of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University. I am Marjorie Torres of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your questions into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Dunn. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here today. What I want to talk about is a little bit about the ways in which sourdough bread is a key part of our future. And if we think about sourdough bread, it's a kind of funny thing. What you do to make sourdough bread is you take a little bit of flour, a little bit of water, you mix them together. Microbes arrive from somewhere, from your hands, from the air, from the bread, from the water, and they start to ferment. And that fermentation is at the heart of, of leavening bread. It's at the heart of all of bread culture. It's the heart, at the heart, really, of much of Western culture. We don't think about this very much at all. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it should be the part of any kind of future, really. It's a food thing. It's a special thing. But I'm going to argue that if we think about sourdough bread, we see some solutions to many of our problems that we ha haven't had good solutions to in the past. But before I bring you to sourdough bread, I want to take you in a very different direction, which is to think about global agriculture. And specifically in the context of global agriculture, I'm going to talk about uh, the pests and pathogens of our crops. Now, you may be more familiar with thinking about the pests and pathogens of humans. This happens to be a map from one of our studies of the number of kinds of pests and pathogens of humans in different political regions. So redder areas have more kinds of human pathogens. But we could think about the same kind of thing happening with our crops, except that we would have a different map, a different list of demons for each one of our crops. And this matters because one of the things that we've done to our crops is we've dramatically changed their ability to respond to those pests and pathogens. And this is a general topic I've written about in the book Never Out of Season, which will be the backdrop for a lot of what I talk about today. A key piece of what we've changed that makes our crops more susceptible to pests and pathogens is the number of kinds of crops uh, that we rely on. And we can think about this in a bunch of different ways. I mean, one very visceral way is to think about what kind of waste we produce. And so if you go to New York City, this is Clint Pennock and uh, Median on Broadway in New York. And he's studying the ants in New York. And what he's found is that we spill so much waste over into those medians, waste from our food, that almost half of the carbon molecules in those ants come from corn syrup. And so this is one kind of measure of how simple our diets have become. We eat so much corn and corn syrup that it's actually making the ants that live adjacent to us sick. But another way to think about this is to look at our sort of daily plate. Where do our calories come from globally? And what this plate shows is the proportion of our plant-based calories that come from different crops uh, for people around the world. And what you'll see is that the vast majority of our calories come from rice, wheat, some source of sugar, corn, soybeans, and potatoes, even though there are thousands of other crop species we could be relying on. This, it turns out, is an incredibly recent phenomenon. Historically, people around the world ate different things in different seasons. 
They ate different things as a function of different cultures. They ate different things in different places. And all that has changed and our diets have been very, very homogenized. And this in some ways doesn't even show the full scope of the problem because even within each one of those kinds of crops, often we homogenize the varieties that we consume. And so not only do we eat huge quantities of corn, but it's typically one of two varieties of corn that a huge numbers of people depend on. And the other thing that's been homogenized is all of those foods tend to come from very few companies. And so this figure shows the proportion of seeds sold and owned by different of the main seed, main seed supplier companies in the world. And so we have a situation where we eat very few things, very few varieties of those things, and they're supplied to us by very few companies. There are a whole bunch of kinds of problems we can think about with this situation in terms of health and well-being, in terms of equity. But one of the biggest problems is that by doing this, we put all our eggs into one or very few baskets. And, and this creates a predictable scenario. The predictable scenario is that monoculture, growing few or one crop, sets the stage for a cycle of collapse and rescue, where rescue depends on one or another form of biodiversity again and again. Now, this narrative is one I'm going to come back to in, in several stories today. But we can think about it first in the context of bananas. Bananas are a totally ridiculous fruit. Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy, thought it was probably bananas and not apples that were in the Garden of Eden. They're a silly fruit. They're sort of, you know, funny shaped. They're yellow. Uh, but we didn't used to eat them. If we go back 150 years in North America, we wouldn't have eaten hardly any bananas. They would have been sort of a novelty here and there. But then industrial banana producers figured out that you could take one variety of banana called the Gros Michel, and you could produce clones of it. And then you could plant that banana over huge geographic areas, areas that, that expanded to be the size of entire countries. And they would all be exactly identical because they were clones. And so from an industrial perspective, this was perfect. Every banana was just like every other banana. One banana was more similar to the banana next to it than identical twin humans are to each other. And so you could make lots of bananas, you could put them in a banana-sized box, you could send them to people, and you could convince American kids that bananas were good for them because these companies also ha had the, the influence of the U.S. government behind them. And so this worked great for the banana companies, not so much for lots of other people who were part of this story, and it became part of sort of Americana, and so this is an advertisement for bananas. Ham banana rolls, you know, they're delicious, they're meaty, they're nutritious, they're not really any of those things but we were convinced that they were those things. But the problem with all of this, or one of the big problems, is that this simplification of agriculture, planting one clone of banana across a huge geographic area, means that if any one of those bananas, if a single banana clone is infected by a pathogen, it can kill every single other banana on that landscape. And the banana companies knew this from the very beginning, but everything was going so well that who had time to invest in that kind of scenario? Who had time to worry about the problems when you could just keep growing more bananas? And so what, that's what they did. They grew these bananas at huge, huge scales. And then predictably, the, the pathogen showed up. Panama disease showed up and proceeded to wipe out banana plantation after banana plantation after banana plantation. And once it got in the soil, you couldn't even grow new bananas there if you got new bananas from somewhere else. And so it was a huge, crazy problem. And for a while, it looked like maybe bananas were just done. And then the bananas, it was so, and so what they'd done was they planted a monoculture and didn't plan ahead, and it collapsed. They planted a monoculture and didn't plan ahead, and it collapsed. This is a refrain you'll hear again. The rescue came from the Cavendish banana. And the Cavendish was another variety of banana. Somebody else was growing elsewhere. And it was discovered it looked more or less like the Gros Michel banana. So you could convince Americans who weren't paying that much attention to their food in the first place that this was the same thing. It tasted different, but it looked the same. And it would grow even where Panama disease was present. And so what did they do? Well, the one thing you would for sure not want to do is plant this one clone of banana, again, at a huge spatial scale, and worry about the same kind of problem. But it's exactly what they did again. 
And so now the situation we face globally is this one clone of banana is the vast majority of what we, we buy in the store. And this banana now faces the same kinds of problems. A new pathogen has emerged that threatens the entirety of this clone of banana. And, and if it struck that banana down, it wouldn't ruin the banana companies. They would again look for a new variety. But it would destroy the livelihoods of the people in these countries that depend on bananas. This seems like a weird story. It's a crazy story. It's a story about bananas that are growing clonally at the scale of countries. And yet it turns out to be a very common kind of story in the history of agriculture. And I would argue it's going to be a more common story in the future of agriculture. And so you can, you can, this is so common that we can talk about it almost any place. And so just to pick a landscape, I thought I would talk about a landscape I know well. This is River Alta in the northern Bolivian Amazon. And this is where I worked as a graduate student. You see me here with much more hair, although you can see it's already starting to go, right? The, the future is foretold. Um, but in this forest that I worked, I looked at how long it took tropical forests to recover when you cut them down. And what I paid a little bit of attention to when I was a graduate student, but not enough, was the reality that this forest, if you walk through it, it contained vestiges of a whole series of kinds of agricultural collapse. And so what I'm holding in this picture, those are Brazil nut pods. And those are there because Native Americans used to create conditions where Brazil nut trees would be favored. And so Brazil nut trees grew up all across this region. And so that's why Brazil nuts largely come from this region still today, because of that abandonment. But the other reality is that in the same region, you get abandoned cacao trees in forests. You get rubber trees in forests that have been tapped, and you get cassava that faces all sorts of challenges. And so I'm going to pick these stories from an individual landscape out of the book to tell you a little bit more about how these, these repeated uh, episodes of simplification and collapse look. I'll start with cacao, because everybody likes cacao. Cacao is chocolate. This is a cacao pod. This is, where, this is what your chocolate comes from. Historically, cacao was dispersed by megafauna. So things like giant sloths and gomphotheres would reach up, grab these big pods, munch through them. They'd eat that, that white stuff, which is kind of a sweet flesh. And then they would poop out the seeds, and cacao trees would grow in, the, in their wake. Um, but then at some point, Native Americans and the Amazon figured out that you could take that flesh and you could, kids could eat it as a treat, or you could ferment it and make a pretty good drink. And so that was the story for most of the history of cacao, until at some point somebody figures out that there's an additional use, which is that you can take those seeds, you can grind them up, and you can add things to them, and it makes a drink, a kind of savory hot cocoa which is what happens in Central America. Cacao is not native to Central America, but it gets moved up to Central America very early. And for the Aztecs and the Mayans, cacao becomes a kind of currency. You want lots of cacao. And Montezuma famously drank huge quantities of cacao every day. And so it was a sacred drink. It was an important drink. And it all depended on this weird tree that used to be dispersed by the megafauna. Um, then Europeans arrived. And at first, Europeans don't pay any attention to cacao. Columbus, on his third trip, encounters a, a boat of Chontal Maya, and the boat's full of cacao seeds. And he, uh, Columbus notices that when, when one of the seeds drops, that the Chontal Maya pick it up with the avidness uh, that they might have if they were picking up a stray eyeball. Now, it's, a, it's an awful commentary on the time that Columbus knows what a stray eyeball looks like, but he doesn't realize that he should take some of this cacao home. And so he doesn't. He leaves it be, and so it takes a few more expeditions until anybody realizes that, oh, this is something that should go back to the queen, and eventually cacao makes its way to Europe. And when it makes its way to Europe, it becomes, it's discovered that you can use the different parts of the cacao seed for different things. So you can make cacao nibs, you can make cocoa butter, you can make cocoa powder, and all of those are used industrially very early on at, at pretty big scales as sort of an upmarket uh, food supply. But as this happens, suddenly there's a huge demand, and so we suddenly there's a huge demand, and so many more cacao trees are needed. But the problem is, if you're in the native range of cacao, or even in the part of Central America where it was more heavily domesticated, there's so many pathogens of cacao that if you grow the trees close together, they get attacked. And so what people did was to move the cacao up and over the Andes to where it wasn't native. And it could grow in sort of peaceful harmony at huge densities. And so you saw cacao plantations like this. 
And, and a few people got so rich off of this cacao that it, like in Vinci's, Vinci's Ecuador, people were actually sending their underpants to France to be laundered, and then they were coming back. And so there, still to this day, there's a small Eiffel Tower in Ecuador that marks this incredible wealth. But predictably, what happens is eventually one of those pathogens from the Amazon finds the trees, because this is what happens, and destroys them all. And so again here, they planted a monoculture and didn't plan ahead and it collapsed. Now, it, cacao was never uh, really rescued in this part of Ecuador, but it was rescued in a way by geography. By moving cacao, people were able to get it away from the, the pathogen that attacked it in Ecuador and also another pathogen, which is broom. And the place that cacao was largely moved to was eastern Brazil, a place, place called Bahia. Now, Bahia seems like maybe it's in the same region as native cacao because they're both in the same country. But the truth is Bahia is separated from the native region of cacao, the region where witches root broom and the other pathogens are common, by grasslands. And so it was really kind of protected from all of those pathogens, much as if it were on the other side of an ocean. And so as a result, there was a huge boom in cacao production in Brazil, and in Bahia in particular, and Brazil would become the number one producer of cacao in the world. 600,000 hectares of plantations just in this one region. But then what happens? Predictably, the pathogen finally makes its way to Bahia. It then starts to spread. It spreads some more. It spreads some more, and this entire region's cacao is wiped out. As a result, Brazil goes from being a number one producer of cacao to being a net importer. And Africa, West Africa in particular, becomes the main producer of cacao. And so what's happened here again is that they planted the monoculture and didn't plan ahead and it collapsed. But there was also something else going on here. There was also a bad guy. And early on in the story, people thought that maybe the bad guy was somebody from West Africa, somebody who stood to benefit from destroying the cacao of Bahia. Until 2006, when this guy came forward and said that he and his friends had intentionally introduced the pathogen of cacao from Rondonia in Brazil, right, right across the border from where I worked in Bolivia, to Bahia to take down the cacao barons so that they could come into more political and local power. It looks as though at least parts of this and maybe all of it are a true story. As a result, most of the cacao in the world now grows in West Africa and to a lesser extent tropical Asia. And so the rescue in this case was geography. But then there was something else because in those regions, cacao was assailed by yet another pathogen a pathogen that causes this swollen shoot virus. And although I won't talk about it much today, the thing that keeps cacao from being absolutely destroyed even before uh, witch's brim arrives in West Africa, and at some point it will, is that the cacao is actually defended by a kind of ant called the weaver ant. And if you want to know more about this story, you can read the book. I don't have time to tell it today, but this is just another way in which biodiversity helps to save us when we put our eggs all in one basket. Take another example, rubber. So if you go out today and look at the tires of an airplane, those tires are almost 100% natural rubber. If you kick the side of your tire on your car, that sidewall is natural rubber. If you look at any big tractor tire, those are all natural rubber. And that natural rubber comes from rubber trees in the Amazon. Those trees are tapped traditionally by serengueros, rubber tree harvesters who would make cuts into the tree, and this is great art by a rubber tree harvester. And then the rubber tree harvesters would go and collect from tree to tree uh, from early in the morning until late in the day. It was really terrible work, and then it would be shipped downstream. And this is yet another one of these stories where the people who were selling the rubber were making lots and lots of money, and the people who were running these circuits through the Amazon were living hard, often terrible lives. Uh, many of the people who, who worked these rubber trees died at the hands of the people who, who were uh, in, in charge of those rubber trees. Meanwhile, the, the barons who were in charge of making the money built beautiful things like this opera house in Manaus. And that was the beginning of the story of rubber, that it would only be harvested from that region. Um, 
But then Kew Gardens had an idea, and Kew Gardens decided to contact this guy, Henry Wickham. And Henry Wickham was a funny guy. He had the idea he would go to the Amazon, he'd make great wealth. He and his mom worked out a scheme where he would shoot birds, and he would send the feathers of the bird ba the birds back to her in England, and she would put them in hats and sell the hats, and they would be rich together and, and live a long life, mother and son. But it turned out he was terrible at shooting birds. And so this was not working out. And so Kew Gardens contacted them, and he was, all, he was totally ready to, to do something. And they said, what we would like you to do is to get us some rubber seeds so that maybe we could try to grow them somewhere else and so we're not entirely dependent on the rubber of the Amazon. Because all of that rubber in the world was still coming from those trees out in the wild. And so Wickham said, yeah, I'll try. And relatively quickly, he was able to gather 70,000 seeds of rubber trees. Of those 7,000 made it to London, of those 2,800 were sent to Asia, perhaps 100 survived that trip. And from those, a handful of seeds would then beget, beget a rubber empire. All of the rubber in tropical Asia would come to descend from that handful of seeds, and arguably just one or two clones of these seeds. And so it's a story at the beginning very much like that story of bananas, except it's not as frivolous as bananas from a consumer perspective, right? We lose rubber, we lose cars, we lose planes, we're in big trouble. Well, enter the story Henry Ford. Henry Ford liked to be in control of things. Very often that was people, it was cars, it was machines. But all of the things that he built depended on rubber, and they depended on that rubber that was now growing in tropical Asia because of Wickham. Henry Ford decided this was not acceptable. And so what he was going to do was to go back to the Amazon and make a huge plantation in which he grew rubber trees at high densities, produced tons of rubber, and solved all the world's problems and became a hero, but also connected his assembly line directly to the forest. What lots of people knew at this time was that that was very unlikely to work because in the native region, there's a thing called leaf blight that attacks the rubber tree. And if you grow rubber trees in, in any density of more than two or three, if you grow them in a monoculture, leaf blight spreads tree to tree and kills all the trees. Lots of people have learned this the hard way. Henry Ford was different, though. He, he, would, he would solve this problem. And, and so Henry Ford was given or bought at a discount a huge hunk of land in Brazil the size of a US state. And then he said about clearing that land, which what he would modestly call Fordlandia, and, and planting rubber trees. And so he does this at huge, huge scale, huge expense, and he, and he puts little towns up that look to me like the towns in Michigan and, and that other Fordland where I grew up. And everything was going great, and all the people who, who might have told Ford, but probably didn't, that this was going to be a disaster, uh, had to bite their tongues. But the thing that nobody seemed to remember was that in the other cases in which people had planted lots of rubber trees together, the problems didn't start until the rubber trees were tall enough that their leaves touched. And then the leaf blight could go tree to tree, and then the trees were toast. Well, for a while that didn't happen in Fordlandia. The trees grew tall. They were even tapping rubber. Ford was a hero. And then it happened. Overnight, the trees started to get sick, and the entire plantation had to be cut down. And, and so nature won. But it won because he planted a monoculture. It, it, it won because he planted a monoculture and didn't plan ahead, and the whole thing collapsed. But what's different about this story is that in most of these stories, after all this collapses, people at least get a new variety of plant to try. In this story, Henry Ford said, just give me some new land. And so we traded back for Landia. He got a new hunk of land in Brazil. It was a little bit different. Maybe it was going to be better this time. He did exactly the same thing. He planted a monoculture again and didn't plan ahead, and it collapsed. And in this case, there's no rescue. There's, we've not solved this story. And so it's true today that nearly all of the rubber in the world is a monoculture of the most susceptible variety, all grown in tropical Asia. And all it would take is one spore of leaf blight to wipe it all out within a couple of years. And there's not a solution. If there is going to be a solution, it's almost certainly going to come from the wild varieties of rubber in the forest that might have resistance to leaf blight that could be bred in or introduced using new genetic approaches. But virtually no one's working on this. And so we just wait until a disaster happens. 
and hope the trees are around. Another example, cassava. I think most of us probably don't eat that much cassava, but globally, cassava, uh, manioc, yucca, it's an incredibly important sustenance crop. Upwards of half a billion people depend on this crop for survival. It's 80% of the diet in parts of the Congo Basin. It's a hugely important crop, but it gets way less attention because it's not a glamorous crop. You know, it grows in the ground, looks kind of funny, um, and yet very, very important. Well, a mealybug, a thing that looks like this animal turned up on cassava in the Congo Basin, and it started to cause problems. But because we hadn't prepared, we weren't prepared, nobody knew where, where, what to look at, nobody really knew who to connect with, it took three years between when this was first found and when anybody identified what it was. Three years to put a name on this little thing, which would only be, be called cassava mealybug um, for, for, for a little bit of a lack of creativity. And by then it had spread across three or four countries. And so it started to look to those who were involved in the story like Famine at a scale that people hadn't seen since the Irish potato famine was about to stalk Africa. And there weren't many solutions because we didn't know, we knew hardly anything about this mealybug. And the people dealing with it were too poor to spray pesticides at the scale necessary to control it. And anyway, mealybugs, because of that wax you see, they're pretty hard to control with pesticides. Then this guy, Hans Heron, a hippie from UC Berkeley, Swiss by by, by birth, but at this point when he was at Berkeley, he decides he's gonna solve the problem. And he's gonna solve the problem by going to the native range of this mealybug, which has been sort of just guessed at based on the, the identification of what it might be. Now it's a new species, but its relatives are somewhere in the Americas. And Hans Heron decides he's gonna, he's gonna walk from California through the Americas looking for the cassava mealybug with the idea that if he finds the cassava mealybug where it's native, he can find something that eats it, grow that up in huge abundance, and release it in Africa and kill the cassava mealybug and save cassava. This, needless to say, seems like a long shot. But he starts walking, and he finds absolutely nothing. He gets to Colombia, he finds what he thinks might be the cassava mealybug. It turns out to be another mealybug no one's ever named before, that now is called Heron's mealybug in honor of him. But, but really, he's not finding what he needs. And so he starts talking to his friends, and he tells Tony Bellotti, who you see here, Tony, if you see a mealybug in cassava, make sure you, you collect it so we can figure out, you know, anywhere you've traveled is where this is native, and maybe collect what eats it. Well, Tony had gone to Paraguay to get a divorce with his wife, and while he was there, you know, that's not the most pleasant thing in the world, so he decided to do some collecting. And in Paraguay, he finds this amazing mealybug. It's the same one. Quickly, he looks for things that are attacking the mealybug, and long story foreshortened, he and Heron find this wasp, which lays its eggs in the bodies of mealybugs. They then release it at huge scales. It spreads across West Africa. It controls the mealybug, and it saves $20 billion agriculturally by most estimates, and the whole effort to introduce this wasp cost about $46.9 million. And so this is a case where the rescue was natural history, wasps, a systematics, the naming of life, a little madness, that of Heron, and a whole bunch of luck. And so what you see again and again here then is a, a pretty super predictable cycle. Again and again, monoculture puts us at risk, Again and again, what saves us is one or another incarnation of biological diversity. Our knowledge about biological diversity, collections of biological diversity, and the passion and madness of individual people. It's, it's, I think it's fair to say it's a very, very precarious situation on which all of humanity depends. And while we might hope that there's sort of some central agency that controls all of this and has great data, I think in many ways we're really in the dark ages. And we can see this if we compare what we know about the pests and pathogens of our crops with, for example, what we know about rare birds. This is Kirtland's warbler that you see here on the left. Kirtland's warbler is a rare bird in Michigan. 
And we not only know where this bird lives in Michigan, we know most of its individual nests. At the right, you see a new pathogen that's spreading of squash and, and cucumbers in New England and the US, and we have no clue where it lives, nor do we have any clue where it comes from. This, it turns out, is a general reality. In general, scientists can tell you much more about the rarest birds or even frogs in the world than they can tell you about the rare pathogens and pests that threaten civilization via their effects on crops. Just another measure of this, this, these are the best data on the distribution of birds globally. And what you see are these teeny tiny pixels, teeny tiny squares if you look carefully. And in each one of those squares, we know which and how many bird species are present. The, the redder it is, the more species are present. This, for context, are the, this is the same data for human pathogens and pests. It's kind of a surprise we don't know more about human pathogens and pests. We should. But notice the scale of the pixels is huge. North America, uh, Brazil, th this is a special sort of ignorance um, given what these pathogens and pests can do. Our knowledge about the distribution of crop pests and pathogens, it's so poor that we can't even make a map. And so what do we do about this? The answer is knowledge, but the answer is also that we have to figure out how to know enough about all the species that attack our crops and know enough about the species that can save us. And we have to have diversity in many baskets. All of this will require different money, more investment in museums, research collections, and involvement of the public. Now, to consider this latter piece, let's turn now to sourdough bread. I promised we would get to sourdough. I'll say, though, as a, as, a, as a loop on this story, that if you want to learn more about the other, other ways in which individuals have saved or failed to sail, save our crops, th those are in this book. And so Ahmed Amri, who you see at the bottom, uh, is along with a small handful of people responsible for saving the seeds, the ancient, ancient seeds of Syria during the war. Nikolai Vavilov is responsible for saving many of the seeds of the world. And that seed bank in the back is responsible for guarding the sing single biggest collection of seeds. And yet, while these people have, have done these amazing things, we don't have collections of the beneficial species of microbes that we might want to have. We don't have a collection of things like wasps that might help save, help save us from mealybugs. And so this is the story I tell in the book, but it's part of the story. The other part I can lead into is sourdough. So sourdough, as I mentioned, is, is a kind of bread that's made by leaving out some set of ingredients so that microbes colonize those ingredients. It's the most ancient kind of bread. It's the bread the Egyptians would have made. This is a, these are actually mummified breads from Egypt. And these were, these were almost certainly sourdough breads, reliant on natural microbes that colonized them. And this story of sourdough bread is also a story of humans because it's a kind of bread that spread with us around the world. And each place we went, we made the sourdough slightly differently, but the microbes also evolved and they changed as a function of where that we were. And so there was a moment in time where if you went to all the places that people ate bread, each bread would have had different microbes. But then like these other monoculture stories, the monoculture returns. In the 1900s, people figure out how to freeze dry yeast, one kind of yeast, and sell it. And so that one kind of yeast comes to be the thing we use to make bread in general. So that most bread now relies not on a mixture of interesting microbes that add cool flavors, that add cool aromas, that improve the nutrition of the bread, but it, it instead re requires the, the domesticated version of uh, you know, the yeast diversity we once had, a single variety of yeast. The good news, though, and I think very different from some of the other crop stories, is that many people still have traditional sourdoughs. And so if you travel around the world, in different places, you still find bakers at home with sourdough starters that they've made themselves or they've passed along generation to generation. And so we started to think, you know, what if you could travel the world, find all of these different sourdough starters and conserve them, but also study which of the microbes are best and which ones we might need in the future 
when that common yeast we use for everything starts to fail, or when we want different flavors. And so we started to think about this more, and, and really there's not anything else like this. There's a museum of sourdough at Parathos in Belgium, but it includes a, a small number of starters. And, and we thought we could do it. We thought we could survey the sourdoughs of the world and find and save the most useful microbes. And then in doing so, we could figure out what conditions favor the most unusual microbes. And maybe we could even find heritage microbes on the verge of extinction. And the good news as we thought about this was that we actually run the largest group in the world for engaging the public in scientific discovery. Six faculty, 10 postdocs, hundreds of students, and hundreds of thousands of citizens we engage. And so we, we connected with all those people and reached out and told people that we wanted to see their sourdoughs to figure out if they had unique microbes that we should be conserving or that just offered up new flavors. And here you see the beginning of this project. This is Liz Landis and Ben Wolf. And here they are confronted with sourdough samples that have been shipped to them from around the world. And quickly this became clear that this was working. These are the sourdough samples we have so far. The dots show individual starters and where they came from. And so our next step is to continue to work on these and figure out what lives in them. And our next next step is to do the same for all of the fermented foods of the world. And in doing this and looking at all the starters, the point is to know the good species and the bad species and where they are so that when we get in trouble, we're ready. But we're also ready if we just want to find a new taste or aroma or some other way to enrich our daily experience. And it's working, which is super cool. But the other reality that was suggested to us when we started to do the sourdough work was that this was really just a beginning. What if we can engage the public not just in helping us to document their sourdoughs, but also to help us to document where mutualists of crops live that people haven't been paying attention to, where pests and pathogens of crops live that nobody has seen yet. And so we started a series of projects to do just that. This is Margarita Lopez Uribe, and she studies a species of bee, a squash bee, that does nothing other than pollinate squash flowers. It's an amazing, cute little bee. You see it here. Uh, the bees pollinate the flowers. The male bees, they're kind of lazy. When the females are doing most of the pollinating, the males kind of hang out in the flower and they get drunk on the nectar and they just sort of wait there until a female shows up and then they fly out and they mate and they die. But the females of these wasps, these bees are the best pollinators of squash. But we don't know where they live. And so we started a project to get people to take pictures of bees and other insects visiting squash and other cucurbit flowers around the world, anywhere in the world. And then we're working to use what's essentially facial recognition software to identify which bees are at which flowers and how these bees are distributed. We're building on work that other people have begun to do in which they've documented the ability of facial recognition software or software like it to identify the pathogens of crops. And so, for example, Marcel Salate, who I write about in the book, actually has been able to show that he has an algorithm that can correctly identify the pathogens of a series of crops 99.5% of the time. And so imagine that we get people to take hundreds of thousands of pictures, millions of pictures of insects and pathogens and crops and start to use that to document the diversity of what's out there, but also to start to document the problems we're having. And so as another example, Lori Shapiro is the world expert on cucurbit wilt, what you see at the right here. These plants that have they've had kind of a, a squash heart attack. Their veins clogged with an Erwinia pathogen. The Erwinia pathogen is, is vectored by a beetle, but we don't really know where the beetle lives and we don't really know where the pathogen lives. And so Lori is working with people to get pictures of squash from around the world so we can know not just the pollinators, but from the plants themselves, which beetles are present and where do we see this wilt so that we can anticipate it before it ruins Halloween but also the sustenance food of millions of people. And so here you see high schoolers helping with this project, looking for squash bees and looking for squash beetles at a high school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Another example, Kaveri Kargupta is working to try to figure out what the pollinators of chili peppers are in India. Chilies are not native to India, 
but were embraced by my Indian cooking culture, and so have become incredibly diverse. But part of that diversity is due to the pollinators that are moving pollen from one plant to another around India. We have no idea what those pollinators are, and so if they go missing, we wouldn't even know which species to look for. And, and so Kaveri is now working to get thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even more Indians, to take pictures of the insects pollinating chilies. And so we can imagine a vast platform that connects us back to these crops, that connects us to sourdough, that connects us to all of these kinds of observations somebody needs to make, but that as scientists we've not been able to do. But what can you do? I think in part, there's, there are already movements at hand that are making a big difference. The new Nordic food movement, for example, emphasizes eating foods that are native to their region. And granted, not all of the things that will grow in Denmark are my favorites, and, and yet this sentiment of reconnecting food to what grows where people are is hugely important. In the U.S., the farm-to-table movement echoes a similar idea of connecting people to what will grow in their region and to the individual farmers in their region. And doing this is really important for a variety of reasons, but one of them is that it emphasizes diversity in food. It provides farmers a way to think about other varieties that you, as you begin to appreciate different foods more, might want. But the other message I want to leave you with is that there's another bigger possibility, that by engaging people around the world and helping us to not only eat these foods and think about what their local foods are, but actually to help us do science, citizen science, that we can build a framework for the future that's very different, a framework in which the future of agriculture depends, a framework in which the future of agriculture builds on the work and choices of scientists, museums, but also you. And so with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rob Dunn, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, so what can I do tomorrow as an, as an individual consumer do? That, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think one thing you can do is you can engage our sourdough project. You can engage our projects. If you want to grow a small garden, you can plant squash, you can plant chili peppers, and you can watch them. It's hugely helpful. But, but the other thing you can do is to start to pay attention to what you eat, pay attention to the flavors, pay attention to the differences in variety. You know, I think we've become used to thinking about, you go to the store and it seems like there are lots of kinds of things, but as you look in more detail, it really is, we're seeing more and more creep in, but the average store is really full, mostly of boxes of corn that's ground up. And so by shopping in that part of the store that's still real life foods, or shopping at your farmer's market, and learning the different varieties and favoring varieties you're not used to, it's actually a hugely helpful thing. Now that's never gonna be for everybody, right? There's often a cost to choosing new varieties. And yet, if even some people choose those varieties and help favor them and favor a market for them, it, it makes a huge difference in food resilience. If you think about the banana example, you know, it, it didn't matter that there were lots of Cavendish bananas to save uh, banana plantations when the grocery Michelle disappeared. It just had to be somewhere. And so if, if some market is favoring local varieties that might someday save us, it, it's really a, a big boon. And so that's one thing. 
you know, know your farmers, start to grow some food, even a teeny bit of food. These are all things that help. Um, I would say the other thing is that, you know, every so often there are opportunities to help support uh, research that doesn't seem very sexy on the distribution of some plant pathogen or, you know, to take the simple example, it would, it would cost uh, $150,000. We can make a global database of where the pathogens and pests of crops live. That's not sexy. And it's almost boring. And, and yet, you know, when you vote to fund important basic work like that, it, it helps us all to take those next steps. Thank you for that answer. The next question is, can I send in my sourdough starter to your project? So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we, we initially asked people to contribute sourdough starters. It was wildly more successful than we thought. And so we got a thousand samples from around the world very quickly. What we're now doing is trying to figure out how best to scale that up to, to be able to, to sample and identify the microbes in, in tens of thousands of starters. And so right now you can sign up to hear about our results when they come out. And the hope is in the future we find some way to, to fund a sustainable model to identify what's in when all those starters run the world. Um, the other part too is that, I mean, I would love to know what's in different traditional yogurts and cheeses and if you go culture to culture, there are, there are many different kinds of fermented foods about which we know very little and, and for which it's entirely possible that we're seeing extinction of communities that exist nowhere else on Earth. Um, and so right, right now, the short answer is sign up to hear, hear more results when they come out. And we'll also tell you if we find a way to take more samples. Um, but also pay attention to your fermented food and love your starter. The next question is, do the microbes in sourdough starters actually influence the flavor? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think that the, the industry has mostly assumed that the flavor of bread is really determined by the the kind of flour you use or the other things you add to the bread. But a bunch of recent experiments have made clear that which microbes you have in the starter make a huge difference for the flavor of the bread, for which vitamins are in the bread, um, for the even the kind of gooiness and the mouthfeel of the bread. They're really all determined by what kinds of microbes you have. And so already we have a few microbes that we can say, ooh, that one makes the bread extra gooey or that one makes it extra sour. Um, and what we would like is to have a huge panel of kinds of microbes that do all sorts of things. And so if somebody wants to make a specific kind of bread, you can say, ooh, that's the one that, that does that. Uh, and what's great is I mean, most of the bread you eat is, is coming from very few kinds of microbes. And so, you know, imagine all the flavors that you've never tried just because we haven't, we haven't found the microbes to, to produce them yet. Okay, we have time for one more question. If funding was a limitation, what research would you do? Yeah, um, so, so I, I think in light of the talk today that I think we have a method for starting to catalog, save, and understand the, the species living in the fermented foods around the world. And so um, I think that's something that needs to be done, and now is the time to do it, because cultural knowledge and heritage foods are being lost really quickly. Um, and so we've probably already seen the extinction of a bunch of communities of microbes unique to particular foods that nobody collected. And so to really travel the world and, and find all of these uh, 
endangered com food communities and, and start to save them. We, we have a giant seed bank for our seeds. We've got no bank that keeps our valuable microbes. And so that, that would be one. I mean, I could probably list about 50 uh, things if, if we kept going, but th that's, that seems like a core one. And it's a good one because we know how to do it. We just haven't done it. And it has to happen now. I would like to once again thank Dr. Rob Dunn for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabReads for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2017. You will receive an email from LabReads letting you know when this webcast will be available for reapply. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.